in the Old Testament reading in the beginning of the service this week, it, that reading was the early part of Exodus chapter 17. It's one of those passages where the children of Israel are upset and they're complaining to Moses. But I like the fact that in this passage, their need and their concern is legitimate. They need water. And, and water is not optional. It, it's not like food where you can get by for a number of weeks. You have days, generally about three. And they go to Moses and they just demand he do something about the problem. So you have thousands of unhappy, on-edge, thirsty people. And let's be honest, most of us, if we had children that hadn't had anything to drink for a day or two in a hot climate, we would be pretty tempted to join in the let's go fuss at Moses parade. I, I do think they were a little accusatory about the whole thing. They always accuse Moses of leading them out of Egypt to murder them. And that's quite a jump, isn't it? There is a problem, so obviously you're trying to kill us all. And of course, Moses goes to the Lord and says they're getting ready to stone him. And he might be right because they might be thinking, we're all going to die, but you're going to die first. Or he might be doing a little exaggeration of his own. God does provide water, though, and they are saved and everyone calms down. But the name of the place and the summary that's given in the last verse of the passage is very telling. The question that we're told the people kept asking was, is the Lord among us or not? And wow, after everything they had seen, everything they'd come through, we're told that this problem shook them to the point of wondering if God was really in their midst. It makes us ask how we interpret problems when they come upon us. Do we handle them in faith? Do we go to the Lord in prayer? Do we wait patiently, trusting that if we press forward with faithfulness, that God will see us and our families through? We do realize that the children of Israel in the wilderness had a deadline. You know, so patience was tough. You know, if you're looking ever at the last few chapters of the book of Acts, when Paul has been arrested and he just kept going from hearing to hearing and authority to authority, he waited in jail one time for two years between hearings. And then there was another time he waited a year. But he was always trusting in this promise he had been given by God that he would, in the end, give his testimony in Rome. But to receive that promise and have delays where he just sat for one year or two years at a time, I don't even think we can begin to imagine patience like that. And admittedly, Paul did not have a three-day death by dehydration deadline, but he did have to trust in promises with a crazy amount of patient faith. Maybe this passage in Exodus should just remind us to share our needs with God without the accusations and the doubts, and definitely without forgetting all that God has brought us through in the past. This passage we're going to look at in John suggests that we still have a need for water. We just have to realize we have the need for some internal living water that will help us grow in the face of life's challenges. It, this passage is long, and I'm going to read through it all, but I'm going to try hard not to belabor the discussion of the passage just out of respect for time. It's John 4, 5 through 42, and I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And John tells it like this. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? 
And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, What do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely no one has brought him something to eat. Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and complete his work. Do you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there for two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that he, that this is truly the Savior of the world. Now this may be a little backwards, but look at how Jesus just at how fulfilling Jesus finds time spent in having a spiritual discussion with someone that leads to a changed heart and life. Jesus is waiting for food, but he found time spent with this woman to be energizing for him. Though dis the disciples didn't yet apparently know really the joy of seeing someone changed by a faith encounter with Jesus. In the previous chapter, Jesus had a nighttime encounter with Nicodemus. Now he is having a daylight discussion with a Samaritan woman. She comes at noon, which isn't the greatest time of the day. It's hot, but apparently she wants to avoid people. Maybe because she was an outcast just because of her social situation. We don't really know all the details. It is pretty clear, clear that she does not want to interact with other people, and she prefers the heat of noon to the crowd of the morning. She's hoping just to be left alone. And this Jewish guy just starts talking to her. She's probably a bit freaked out because she's hoping to avoid everyone. And this guy talks to her. And it's a guy who, for religious reasons, isn't supposed to be willing to have anything to do with her. She even questions the whole thing. She has probably had plenty of life situations that made it clear to her where she would stand in, in a re any kind of relation with a Jewish male. Jesus moves the interaction about all of this to the spiritual side by bringing up her need to ask him for living water. She isn't that different from Nicodemus, as she also initially interprets his words in a very literal sense. She hears him offering her chan the chance to never have to come to this well in the heat of the day again. But Jesus changes tactics and sums up the struggles of her life. 
her marriage situation, it, going through this is not a call to repentance because as a woman, she had no control really over all of that. It does demonstrate that she had not been treated well in her life. She was not used to much in the way of relationships, or at least any kind of relationship that was filled with lasting acceptance. There's no judgment in this list, only an attempt to help her see how truly Jesus sees her. If anything, we should remember that this is a call to healing, not a call to repentance. This is when she understands, that, though, that Jesus is a man of God. Now, she interprets that to mean prophet, and I'm not sure that her experience of religious leaders has been too wonderful. And she definitely doesn't expect any kind of acceptance from a Jewish prophet. So she puts up her defenses. She begins a religious argument about the location where God is to be worshipped. You know, where does God live? It's not an unusual defense. If someone raises the issue of faith, you start an argument. You bring up every religious disagreement you can. And Jesus doesn't even seem surprised by this. He just says it's irrelevant. He wants her to look toward a time when locations will not matter because God will be worshipped in spirit and in truth. It won't be about Jews or Samaritans because Jesus doesn't mention that at all. He just says true worshipers. That's what's important to him. So the worship that he says will be important, it can be by anyone, it can be anywhere, and it will be real beyond everything she has ever known. She does have an expectation of something more. Her people, like the Jews, wait for the anointed one, for the Messiah, who will give them really every spiritual answer that they've been waiting for. And Jesus now, he doesn't hold back. He sim says simply, I am he. This is not a smooth moment. I, I think it looked smoother in the Chosen episode. In John's narrative, the disciples show up they kind of want to know why Jesus is talking with a Samaritan woman, and she just leaves her jar and goes back to the city. Her story isn't over, though. It's just beginning, though she's still figuring things out. When she says to everyone that she met a man who had told her everything she had ever done, her question, he cannot be the Messiah, can he? It's written in the original language in a way that it, it's worded to expect a negative answer. She's still processing just what to believe and what to make of all this. But she does call them to come with her and see. It's the same thing Jesus said to the first disciples, come and see. She may not have worked it out yet, but she is inviting them to work it out with her. And they do. Her testimony brings out many people who join her in finding their way to believe. You know, Nicodemus had so many doubts, but in the end, the Samaritans, they can say not just that they believe, but they know that Jesus is the Savior of the world. It is the only time that the title Savior is used in John's Gospel. The Samaritans know that Jesus is the Savior. He said in chapter 3 that he came not to condemn the world, but to save it. And here it is. He's becoming a Savior to a part of the world. And not an expected part of the world. You know, we can be like the people in the desert. Is God with us or not? In a world this messed up, does God exist or not? Yet when God wants us to know how much we are loved, how much we are known, and how much we are understood, how often do we start to put up our defenses? How, how often do we argue ourselves into a refusal to let Jesus really into our lives? Here Jesus insists that the truth of how well he knows us inside and out isn't supposed to be a barrier. It just shows that he really understands that we need something real, that we need something on the inside. He came not to condemn, but to rescue, just as he told Nicodemus in last week's reading. Jesus brings water into our desert. He brings healing to broken hearts, hope to lonely souls, kindness to hurting people. He doesn't say he knows everything about us to condemn us, but to show us how completely he wants to help us. And we aren't used to that. But then if we're honest, neither was she. Is God with us or not? Yes, he is. He's here uncovering every brokenness in our lives. But the wonderful truth is, when he uncovers everything in us, every wrong, every brokenness, every hurt, every grudge, when he lays it all out there, in no way 
is it about his desire to condemn us? It's always about his desire to heal us. Is God with us or not? He most definitely is. Can we pray together? Lord, you're on our side. And, and when you reveal to us how much you know us, how completely and fully you know us, it, and when you get to the worst of, of, of our wrongs, of our hurt, of our brokenness, of our twisted up nature, we're expecting to be yelled at. We're expecting to be judged. We're expecting to be condemned. And you come to say that you are there completely to heal, to deliver, to rescue, to restore. God, help us to believe the right way because it's all too e easy sometimes to believe the wrong way. Help us to get it right. Help us believe that you desire nothing more than to come into our lives and bring something, something real, something that isn't about where we worship. It's about who we worship. You, the one who is always with us. Help us to trust in, in your healing. Help us to seek and find your healing. And help us to have hearts that are whole because your love is the well of living water that comes up within us and overflows to everything around us. God, heal and deliver and restore us, we pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I want to end with a few verses from Romans 5, verses 8 through 10, and make it our blessing for this week. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. M much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. To make that our blessing for this week. May you find rest in the truth that God loved you completely long before you turned your heart to him. May you experience fully that Jesus died not just to bring healing and forgiveness to your past, but to sustain you through your present. Finally, may you realize that the living Jesus who loves you desires to be a present and active part of your life. May your week be blessed and may you be wonderfully aware of his presence and know that when you experience him close to you, he accepts you and wants nothing more than good for you. Have a great week.